going up, going down. Big 10 win totals, according to FanDuel. Let's break it down right here at the Voice of College Football. One of my favorite statistics that hit me about four or five years ago, so I've been tracking it ever since, is to get a read on how many teams from year to year have a significant increase or decrease in wins. How many teams are on the ascension or decline significantly from one year to another? So I selected three, three wins as being the criteria. So a team goes from six and six to nine and three, significant increase. A team goes from six and six to three and nine the next season. That's a significant decline. So I've been tracking this for four or five years and the numbers are decidedly greater than just about anybody predicts that they will be. Most people are conservative by nature and they believe that teams are going to be generally the same from one season to the next, me included. I noticed this from the major preseason publications that make predictions, Street and Smith's, Athlon's, all of the major publications typically predict that records won't change more than one game or so. But since we've been tracking this, which has been five to six football seasons out of the 65 Power 5 teams, now increased to 69 with the inclusion of the four to the Big 12 two seasons ago, last season, 25 of the 69 teams in the Power 5, 25 of them, had an increase or decrease in wins of at least three from one season to the next. That's significant. And that number is typically between about 18 and 25. One season, it was 29 out of 65. Almost half the teams in the Power Five had a significant win increase or decrease from one season to the next. So keep that in mind when projecting and predicting what's going to happen this college football season because the elites typically stay elite And some of those bottom dwellers, Vanderbilt, typically, typically stay near the bottom. Although we've seen significant upgrades from Kansas and Oregon State in particular in the last few years. So things don't stay the same in college football. Maybe at the very, very top they do for the most part. But throughout the rest of college football, it is extremely volatile. So, for example, in the Big Ten in 2023, five of 14 teams, meaning almost one third of the conference, had an increase or decrease in wins of at least three. Iowa went from 7-5 in 2022 to 10-2. Northwestern, of course, was the the team that blew everybody's minds from 1-11 up to 7-5 in the regular season. And then we had three declines in the Big Ten. Illinois, Minnesota, and Purdue all won eight games in 2022. Minnesota 5-7, Illinois 5-7, Purdue 4-8 this past season coaching changes are one item to look out for. So the other item in this to consider is the actual payout. So if you actually want to execute your prediction, then you want to evaluate the payout. Keep in mind that during a typical NFL or college football regular season game, the payout is even on both sides, typically uh, because Vegas wants to create betting at 50% on each side. But The numbers on these win-loss totals in the Big Ten and throughout college football are skewed heavily on one side. So, for example, Illinois. We'll look at the Illini here in just a second. The payout on the winning side, the plus side, the over is plus 106, meaning if you lay down a $100 bet, Vegas will pay you out 106 on the win. So you make out better than 50-50. But minus 132 for the under So Vegas is encouraging people to play the over, meaning that although they have set Illinois at five and a half, they most likely believe that the Illini are going to fall short of five and a half wins and you are going to make less money. You're going to have to pay out $132. You're going to risk $132 to be paid $100 on the win. Let's check out the Illini for 2024. Got to get a win in weeks one and three against Eastern Illinois and Central Michigan. So two wins in the bag for Illinois. They lost to Kansas pretty decidedly last season. They've got the Jayhawks at home. They should be a underdog in that game. Then starts Big Ten play and let's say Illinois is at two and one at this point. They go to Nebraska. They go to Penn State. They're going to be decided underdogs, especially in Happy Valley. They've got a bye week before Purdue. That's got to be a win if you're taking the over. Michigan, Oregon, that's a 
brutal stretch, of course, of back-to-back games for Brett Bielema's team. Minnesota should be a win if you're going to take the over, and then we get the second bye week as we see across college football this season. Michigan State, Rutgers, Northwestern, not bad in terms of a scheduling finish for Illinois. They could possibly pick up some wins there. Uh, Rutgers on the road is going to be a difficult task, and of course, Illinois lost to Northwestern in overtime this past season. We will have our predictions coming up later this summer. Indiana's got a new football coach as Kurt Signetti takes over for Tom Allen after a failure of a season again for the Hoosiers at 2-7 and seven in the Big Ten, 4-8 and eight overall. They're at plus 104, over 5.5 wins, and minus 28 at 5.5 for the Hoosiers. They've got a couple wins out of the gate. They should at least. But then again, Akron took Indiana to overtime last year and would have defeated the Hoosiers if not for a missed field goal. Indiana's got FIU and they've got Western Illinois. They should be 2-0. and They go to UCLA and, of course, the Bruins have had not the best of off seasons, losing their future starting quarterback in Dante Moore and, of course, their coach in Chip Kelly. Deshaun Foster's crew will be waiting at the Rose Bowl. Charlotte has to be a win for this Indiana team. But Charlotte gave... Uh, Maryland a difficult game this past season. There is Maryland. The Terps and the Hoosiers get together on September 28th at Northwestern as well. So you got to figure for Indiana to break five and a half wins. They've got to win the two non-conference games. Of course, they got to win the three non-conference games. So you got to go three and six in the Big Ten to win this bet. Where are the wins? Northwestern Uh, can no longer be counted on as a win as David Braun's doing an exceptional job there. And, of course, they're coming off an 8-5 and season. Added from the Pac-12 dates against UCLA and Washington, it is really difficult for me to find wins for Indiana, three of them in Big Ten play. The most likely candidates are Purdue in the old Oak and Bucket game and then earlier against Northwestern. They do have Maryland at home. And Michigan State has been a team that Indiana has played well against the last few years as Sparty has been down, but Jonathan Smith, an excellent coach in his first year at Michigan State. The Hawkeyes are one of those teams that fooled Vegas last year. They're over under with seven and a half. And of course, they went 10 and two in the regular season, seven and two in the Big Ten, marching on to a Big Ten championship as they improved from seven and five the previous season. They're at minus 142 on the over plus 116 on the under so Vegas of course is encouraging playing the under for the Hawkeyes and a healthy Kate McNamara may have something to do with this over under Iowa State is uh, the second game of the season after the Hawkeyes should get a win against Illinois State they also have Troy at home not necessarily an easy game but they will be a significant favorite there got to go three and oh you would think in the regular season, although this seven and a half win total provides for a lot of buffer for losses here as the Hawkeyes go to Ohio State. They've got Washington at home, a much different team than what we saw in 2023, and we will discuss that with the Huskies in just a second. At Michigan State, Sparty took uh, Iowa to the wire this past season, really close game midway through the fourth quarter. Northwestern Wisconsin at home at UCLA and the Bruins again that does not look like anything close to a daunting task taking on UCLA this year not that the Bruins aren't capable of defeating Iowa then the stretch drive is only two games at Maryland and then a game against Nebraska I'm really not seeing where Vegas is getting five losses for Iowa football here in 2024 as we move it on to the Maryland Terps coming off three consecutive bowl wins but of course the bowl situation does not factor into this prognostication this is strictly the regular season maryland's got uconn at home that should be a win then they go right into big 10 play they also have a date at virginia and they blasted the cavaliers by four touchdowns this last year but again do not necessarily take that as being another easy win for maryland change at quarterback for the terps And also Virginia play just about everyone very close in the ACC. Villanova has to be a win, of course, if Maryland's going to surpass that 7.5 win total uh, after a 7-5 regular season last year. They've got Indiana on the road. They've got a bye week before Northwestern, USC, and Minnesota. I don't necessarily see any brutal stretches, although at the end of the year, facing Oregon on the road, Rutgers at home, 
Iowa, Penn State is a pretty difficult four-game stretch. They will need to defeat Rutgers for sure to give uh, eight wins a shot. you got to think that, uh, if anything, Maryland is shading more towards seven than eight as the Terps sit at seven and a half, according to FanDuel. Michigan, of course, has been blowing away these win totals last three years and going 11-1, 12-0, 12-0, and a national championship the last season. They've got a difficult uh, start. Uh, one of the better teams in the group of five in recent years has been Fresno State, then Texas. So they're going to be 1-0, you would think, taking on the Longhorns and a bit of an underdog probably at home against Texas. But it is a home game in Michigan. It will bring the defense. They've got Arkansas State before they dive into Big Ten play against USC. That's at the big house. And that really is going to, I think, be the barometer of how good this Michigan team is in Big Ten play as the over-under stands at 9.5 and and pays out 100 even for the over and minus 122 for the under. Then you've got Minnesota. You've got a rematch of the national championship game against Washington, although that's going to be a completely different Washington team. The bye week, and then a pretty easy stretch against Illinois and Michigan State before Oregon comes to the big house at Indiana and then off for Northwestern and Ohio State. So if you put it all together, it's a pretty difficult schedule, certainly much tougher than it was in 2023. But the big games are spread out, and Michigan, again, is sitting at 9.5, according to FanDuel. Rival Michigan State, of course, had to go through 2023 with an interim coach after Week 3 in Harlan Barnett. They've had a couple rough seasons after the Mel Tucker breakout in 2021 at 11 and 2. Michigan State, another one from the Big Ten, sitting on that five and a half win total after winning four last year. Uh, the payouts are minus 122 and plus 100, and of course, a new head coach in Jonathan Smith, one of the best hires of the offseason, in my opinion, right there with Mike Elko of Texas A&M. Florida Atlantic's got to be a win, although they took Illinois to a difficult six-point game in Champaign last year, and Tom Herman's back at coach at Maryland for Michigan State. That has been a difficult game in recent years. Prairie View's got to be a win, of course. At Boston College against Bill O'Brien's team should be an interesting affair and a close, close point spread, you would think. Then look at that brutal Big Ten stretch. Ohio State at Oregon. And then after the bye week, Iowa, Michigan, Buckeyes, Ducks, Hawkeyes, Wolverines out. Should be four consecutive losses for Michigan State there. They've got Indiana. They've got at Illinois, Purdue, and Rutgers. Okay, so the closing run, if they can somehow survive and keep the roster intact, keep people healthy, they could pick up some wins. I think a good goal would be two and two to close it out. If Michigan State can go two and one, non-conference. That, of course, means that they've got to go four and five in the Big Ten for the over. So they pretty much have to defeat Boston College, you would think, to surpass five and a half wins. They've got to sweep the non-conference at 3-0, and and then their three wins in conference look like they're coming down the stretch against Indiana, Illinois, Purdue, and Rutgers unless they can sneak one away from Iowa at home. That's the formula for Jonathan Smith and Michigan State to get to six wins in postseason play. That's what they care about. But if you're playing Sparty, it's five and a half for the win total this year. Vegas and FanDuel hate Minnesota this year. Look at this win total. Four and a half. This is the lowest win total in the Big Ten. I'll give it away. Minus 152 on the plus side, plus 124 on the downside. So they're asking you to play below the four and a half. So it's at four and a half, but Vegas most likely believes that Minnesota is going to get to five wins as they did this past season in five and seven, three and six in the big 10. They won a bowl game, uh, but they were the worst bowl team in the regular season in five and seven. They lost their starting quarterback, Ethan Calcumanis to Rudkurtz. So Minnesota starts out with North Carolina. They got drubbed by the heels in North Carolina last year, 31, 13. Rhode Island, Nevada, those have to be wins, of course. So those are the three non-conference games. Most likely, Minnesota goes 2-1, and one, although they should have a shot against North Carolina, minus Drake May, plus Max Johnson in the first game of the season. Difficult starting schedule in the Big Ten with Iowa, 
with Michigan, with USC and UCLA. So the easiest of the first four is on the road. So Minnesota could start 0-4 in the Big Ten. They really could. Most likely they get a win against somebody, probably at the Rose Bowl. Then they have a bye week before they take on Maryland, Illinois, and Rutgers. There is really no one on the schedule that you can look at and say Minnesota is definitely going to win this game. You think most likely they lose against Michigan, USC. Those look like almost definite losses. They do have Penn State at home. That's a upset bid, but they're certainly not as good as Penn State, and they've got Wisconsin on the road. So I understand the four and a half for Minnesota. It could be a rough ride for P.J. Fleck as this uh, program looks to be on the wrong trajectory. And again, Minnesota at four and a half will have our picks this summer. It's almost as if Nebraska did not fire Scott Frost last year based on the results on the field. They just continued to lose one-score games in excruciating fashion. They lost to Maryland based on a pick in the end zone and then a last-minute drive by Talia Tengavailoa and a walk-off field goal. They lost to Iowa on a walk-off field goal. They lost to Wisconsin on the road in overtime when they had a lead in the second half. Just over and over and over, it was like Scott Frost never left. But Matt Rule's a better coach, and that was only season one. They got to five wins. Vegas is expecting a lot out of this football team at seven and a half wins. There you see plus 134 for the over, minus 164 for the under. So they're encouraging the public to bet the over and, uh, I can't imagine Nebraska getting to eight wins against this schedule. Although they could go 3-0 and right out of the gate, non-conference. UTEP, Colorado, Northern Iowa. Of course, they got dragged around the field by the Buffs on the road last year. But Jeff Sims will not be the starting quarterback throwing every other pass to the opposition. Illinois, Purdue, Rutgers is an easy slate to start. And Indiana after the bye week. So it starts very, very easily for Nebraska, and there is a possibility, a decent possibility, that Nebraska is going to start the season 6-0. and They go to Ohio State, they go at UCLA at home, so they could be 7-1. and USC on the road's not pretty, Wisconsin, Iowa, but even if they lose those games, they're sitting at 7-5, and so they got to steal one late, most likely. That's the formula. Start 7-1, and steal one, in the midst of USC, Wisconsin, and Iowa. That is your overplay. Otherwise, it's under for Nebraska at 7.5. Nobody ever expects Northwestern to do anything. During Pat Fitzgerald's time there, they never were an AP preseason top 25 team, and they finished ranked five times. And, of course, what David Braun did last year in the midst of all sorts of adversity was remarkable going eight and five with a bowl win against Utah. So they went five and four in the Big Ten, and the over under this year is five and a half. And Vegas is encouraging the over. So let's see if the opportunity rests here to grab Northwestern with the over. They got to beat Miami of Ohio at home. They've got a history of losing to Mac schools. Duke has dragged them all over the field in recent years. They play Duke every year now, and they lose almost every time. They could possibly steal a win against Duke at home. Manny Diaz taking over the Blue Devils and Malik Murphy at quarterback. They've got Eastern Illinois. So they got to be 2-1. and 3-0 and would be great, of course. At Washington, it's not necessarily a loss like it would have been the last couple seasons. They've got the bye week. They've got a couple winnable games against Indiana and Maryland. Wisconsin, Iowa, Purdue. So these are reasonable games in which they have a shot, but most likely are going to lose against Wisconsin and Iowa in particular. Ohio State, Michigan's a losing proposition to start November. They've got Illinois in the annual rivalry game to finish it off, and they beat the Illini in overtime on the road. So they've got them at Ryan Field to conclude 2024. So here's the formula for Northwestern. To get to six wins, let's not even give them a win against Duke. Let's say two and one non-conference. Let's say they beat Indiana at home. That's three. They go on the road and beat Purdue for four. They win against Illinois. That's only five. So they've got to pull off an upset on the road against Maryland is the most likely candidate. They could possibly take on Wisconsin. They defeated the Badgers on the road last year quite easily. 
Uh, so that's not necessarily a loss, even though the name brands, when you set Wisconsin next to Northwestern, you typically take Wisconsin. But in reality, Northwestern was the better team last year. So there we go for Northwestern. Five and a half seems to be a pretty reasonable number. Now we go to the biggest number in the Big Ten. That's Ohio State at 10 and a half. That's a minus 150 play on the over plus 120 on the under. So they're encouraging the public to play the under, which means that Vegas believes that Ohio State most likely is going to go over 10 and a half wins. Well, based on history, that pretty much makes sense. This is pretty ridiculous in terms of consistency here. Since 2011, Ohio State has had two 10 and two seasons. Every other season has been 11 and one or 12 and 0. Every other season. That's crazy. The non-conference schedule is, of course, a give me. Akron, Western Michigan, Marshall. At Michigan State, okay, the first sign of difficulty appears to be Iowa at home. They go on the road against Oregon. If they're looking ahead, they could trip up against the Hawkeyes. They, of course, could lose to Oregon, a very capable team on the road, who also is going to be on that uh, Vegas trajectory at 10.5, as we will see in just a second. Nebraska-Penn State. Back-to-back difficult games, Purdue, Northwestern, they should be able to handle business with Indiana leading into Michigan. For Ohio State to lose two games, they're probably going to lose to Oregon and Michigan. That's all there is to it. But there is a date at Happy Valley as well. So that's a possible loss. So the possible losses in order are Oregon and Michigan, and then on the road against Penn State, and then look out for Iowa at home. So 10 and a half is not necessarily a give me if you're going to play the Buckeyes on the over. Next up, the co-favorite in the Big Ten, it appears to be Oregon. Coming off 11 and 1, of course, the move to the Big Ten. Non-conference, it's Idaho, it's Boise State, it's at Oregon State. So the Civil War moves from the end of November, rivalry week, all the way into September. But at least college football purists we do have the Civil War, Oregon, Oregon State. So that's no give me, but Oregon's going to be a decided favorite against Trent Bray and his new Oregon State football team with, of course, Jonathan Smith moving to Michigan State at UCLA. So it's it's going to, at this point of the season, still feel like an Oregon Pac-12 season until they dive into Big Ten play against Michigan State, Ohio State, Purdue, Illinois, All those games should be wins. They've got a trip to the big house on November 2nd. I don't even want to call that tricky. That should not be under the radar. These are the defending national champions. They go to Camp Randall to take on Wisconsin. So Oregon at 10 and a half. And the payout is plus 110 minus 134. So Vegas is less confident about Oregon finishing over the 10 and a half. Because of the dates against Michigan, of course, Ohio State, and then on the road against Wisconsin. So Oregon probably need to stay away from the Ducks as they are multi-talented, could win all of these games, but could also trip up a couple stops along the Big Ten schedule. Penn State coming off back-to-back 10-2 and seasons, of course, with losses against Ohio State and Michigan. But they will no longer be in that format where they play the Buckeyes and the Wolverines every year. This is what 2024 looks like for James Franklin. And the over-under is 9.5 for Penn State. And Vegas is going to pay out more money betting the under. Interesting. At West Virginia, had a tougher-than-expected If you look at the scoreboard game against West Virginia, only had a two-score win until a late touchdown. Tricky place to play, Morgantown, and we will see what Penn State's got in week one. Bowling Green's got to be a win, Kent State, of course. Then they've got a couple games that have to be wins against Illinois and UCLA before they go out to the L.A. Coliseum in one of the marquee games in the Big Ten and one of those games that when these Pac-12 teams decided to go into the Big Ten that we looked forward to. Penn State at USC. Then the bye week and a closing stretch that starts out rough at Wisconsin, Ohio State, Washington, and then closes with a whimper at Purdue, at Minnesota, and Maryland. So Penn State, of course, that difficult run is USC, Wisconsin, Ohio State, Washington. So for Penn State at nine and a half, 
even if you count Ohio State as a loss and a trip to the Rose Bowl or the trip to the Coliseum as a loss, that's two. Where does Penn State lose the other game? Probably at Camp Randall Stadium is the most likely candidate. They could also lose in Morgantown against West Virginia. I do not see a definitive play here on Penn State at nine and a half. The Boilers are one of those teams that dropped from eight wins to four last year as new coach Ryan Walters took over for Jeff Brom. They start with Indiana State. That's got to be a win. Then they've got a bye week, early season bye week. So that's not necessarily good for a football team, except they are playing Notre Dame and Oregon State the next two weeks. So Purdue, if anything, give it up for the Boilers in scheduling difficult non-conference games as they have the last few years. Last year, Syracuse, Virginia Tech, and Fresno State, no, no one of those teams is daunting, but you put it all together, and that's a tough non-conference schedule because there are no give-me wins. And in this one, there's just one, and then it's Notre Dame and Oregon State having to make that trip all the way to the West Coast. Not the easiest of starts in the Big Ten with Nebraska and Wisconsin with the Badgers on the road at Illinois and Oregon. After the bye week, it's Northwestern at Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan State on the road, and Indiana. So Purdue sitting at four and a half has got to get to five wins. How do they do it? They beat Indiana State. They probably lose the other two non-conference games. So that means that they've got to win. They've got to win four out of nine in the Big Ten. That's not happening. Who do they beat? Let's say Nebraska at home. Let's say Illinois on the road. That's two. Northwestern at home. That's three. And I guess they win the old oaken bucket to get to four wins. That's their path. It's either four and five in the Big Ten in that way with the one and two non-conference record, or they go to Oregon State, pull off a slight upset, you would think, and then they only have to go three and six in the Big Ten to hit the over at four and a half. Give it up for Greg Schiano and the Scarlet Knights of Rutgers just uh, delivered their biggest season in the Big Ten in 10 years as they went to a bowl game. They won the bowl game, finished seven and six and won all their non-conference games, as they will need to do once again here in 2024. Vegas has Rutgers at 6.5. That's going to be their highest win total in forever, certainly during their time in the Big Ten, plus 120. So that Vegas encouraging the overplay, minus 150 on the downside. Rutgers has a typically easy non-conference schedule. Yes, here once again, Howard and Akron, They go to Virginia Tech. They beat the Hokies last year at home by 19 points. But again, going on the road to Blacksburg, difficult place to play. Look at that stretch in the Big Ten. That's not easy. Washington, Nebraska on the road. Wisconsin, UCLA, and USC on the road before a bye week. Win two of those five. That would be an accomplishment. Minnesota, Maryland, Illinois, Michigan State is not necessarily a daunting closing run. That's very manageable, as Rutgers should win three of the final four games. That should be the goal. If they win three there after winning two of those five, they go five and four in the Big Ten, then they are set. They only went three and six last year. So Rutgers, I see where Vegas has six and a half. My original thought was they're not going to get to six and a half. But when you size up two wins out of conference and then the likes of Illinois, Michigan State, Maryland, Minnesota at the end, win three of those, you're already at five. We will again deliver our predictions in the summer. Let us know down below what you think about Rutgers and the rest of the Big Ten. Okay, here's the big wild card team in the Big Ten. Not Chip Kelly, but Deshaun Foster's UCLA team lost its future starting quarterback in Dante Moore to Oregon. We'll see what the defections look like. And again, we are not making predictions right now because we got to get through spring practice and we've got to get through the spring transfer portal season. UCLA is coming off a 7-5 and regular season, won a bowl game against Boise State. And we'll see again how many players leave Westwood. At Hawaii's got to be a win. Then they've got a bye week as they're coming back from the islands. 
to dive right into Big Ten play. So here's a Big Ten opener for you. Indiana at UCLA at the Rose Bowl. They go to LSU. Ouch. Oregon. Look at this sequence right here. LSU, Oregon, Penn State. Minnesota Rutgers, they've got to be able to handle those level teams as UCLA is sitting at five and a half on the over under minus 162 and plus 128. After the bye week at Nebraska, Iowa, at Washington, USC, Fresno State, unusual closing game for UCLA as USC is playing Notre Dame at the Coliseum to close it out. So they've got to win four games in the Big Ten to get to six. That would be Indiana at home. That's Minnesota at home. Let's say they go to Rutgers and win that game. That's three for the Bruins. And then in the closing run of Nebraska, Iowa, Washington, USC, they get to steal one there. Most likely that's going to be at home against Iowa, although they always, almost always play USC tough and, of course, beat the Trojans last year. I think UCLA's got a shot, but there's the uncertainty of a head coach who's never done it before. Rival USC comes to the Big Ten after a 7-5 regular season, so they fell far short of the expectations following an 11-1 regular season the year before in which they went to the Pac-12 championship game and came within that one win of getting to the playoffs. They've got LSU in Vegas to start out, and that's just going to be a phenomenal spectacle right there for college football. Utah State and Notre Dame are the other two non-conference games. So USC always plays Notre Dame, of course, and one of the great rivalries in college football. So when they add another difficult game, as they typically do, that makes for a rough go in the non-conference schedule. So let's say they split the first two games, then they go to Michigan. They've got Wisconsin. Not easy. After they travel to Minnesota, so that makes that more difficult. Even if Minnesota turns out to be one of the worst teams in the Big Ten, it's a road game. Then they've got Penn State at home. This is tricky for Lincoln Riley and crew out of the gate. Then they get a bit of a reprieve with Maryland, Rutgers, and what should be a down Washington team. Not that you can overlook the Huskies and Jed Fish. Will Rogers at quarterback, or Dylan, Will Rogers at quarterback as well. Nebraska, UCLA, and Notre Dame to finish is not easy. So, USC's path to eight wins would be defeat either LSU or Notre Dame to go 2-1 and one non-conference. And then they've got to go 6-3 and three in the conference. So, let's say they lose at the big house and they lose to Penn State. They can lose one other game. It's possible, again... It's key that they defeat either LSU or Notre Dame, but USC sitting at seven and a half. That's certainly a low expectation for a football program that's run by Lincoln Riley in a third season in L.A. Did I say that UCLA was the biggest wild card in the Big Ten? Well, it might be Washington because Jed Fish is a capable coach, but what Kalen DeBoer did in Seattle was remarkable. Took over a team that went four and eight, and of course, took them to the top 10 and 11 wins, and then boom, to the national championship game the next year with back-to-back wins against Oregon and a 14-1 and season. Well, he's gone to Tuscaloosa. So Vegas is seeing 7.5 wins at plus 116, minus 142, so they're encouraging the over play from the public. Weber State's a win. Eastern Michigan's a win out of the gate. Washington State better be a win, and so at least the powers that be, paved a way for the Civil War and the Apple Cup to be maintained on September 14th. So that's going to be an interesting, like, Pac-12 yesteryear look on September 14th with both of those rivalry games being maintained and played in Week 3. So Washington probably is able to pull off a 3-0 start. Northwestern's at home. Rutgers is not a world beater, so they could be 5-0. 4-1, and is probably where the odds stack. Then they've got Michigan at Iowa, so it gets tougher there. The bye week before Indiana. USC, Penn State, UCLA is not easy. Oregon to conclude, as that is going to turn into the Big Ten rivalry for those two teams on the final weekend of the season. Washington at Oregon. So Washington sits at 7.5 for the Huskies to get to 8. 
sweep out of conference, and then they got to go five and four in the Big Ten. So those are wins against Northwestern, Rutgers, Indiana, UCLA, and then one other win, whether that's going to Iowa, pulling off a win, or that's USC at home. Whoever that is, steal one other win, and Washington could still get to an 8-4 and four finish and be the over. And now finally, we've got the Wisconsin Badgers, Luke Fickle's second season, and I believe in Luke Fickle. He did have a rough go in year number one, 7-5 and five regular season, played really well in the bowl game, had a two-score lead twice against LSU and lost to finish 7-6. and six. Alabama in week three. So the Badgers get the two wins to start, and then they play Bama at home. Love that game. That is remarkable. That is a great scheduling move by Wisconsin and Bama. They played in 2015. Really good football game. Derrick Henry took over in the fourth quarter, and Alabama pulled away. At USC, Purdue at Rutgers at Northwestern. I see some wins there. They should be 3-1 and one in that stretch. Penn State, Iowa is not easy. Oregon, after the bye week, they get Oregon at home. Look out, Ducks at Nebraska, Minnesota. So Wisconsin sitting at six and a half, according to Vegas, minus 106 and minus 114. So this is the one even play, basically even play on either side. So Vegas is saying six and a half is fair, and we're laying the money out in a way that it's fair, pretty much even money on both sides. That's the only team in the Big Ten that Vegas has taken that approach. Hey, I got to say, it's just fun to look at football schedules. So we march through the Big Ten. We will do the same for the ACC, the SEC, and the Big 12. Leave your comments down below. Your best plays at this point. Again, we're going to wait for spring football, wait for the transfer portal to do its thing uh, into May before we make our selections right here at the Voice of College Football.